Okay, let's say we have a stock of fish, a population of fish, and we see that the catches are steadily falling every year, and it's probably from fishing too much. Or maybe the catch isn't falling, it's staying about the same from year to year. But we notice that the number of boats on the stock is increasing, and the size of the boats is increasing, and the technology they're using is becoming more advanced. The amount of effort that seems to be going into fishing is increasing, but the catches are not. If there's more effort being put into fishing, but there's not more fish being caught, it's a pretty clear sign that the population is probably declining. This exact thing happened to the Grand Banks cod off the eastern coast of Canada. The scientists who monitored the fish population calculated the fish stock was on the decline, but the policymakers saw that there were still high catches from the fishermen and thought, scientists with their math and their hipster glasses. But the stock was indeed overfished, and the catches weren't changing because of the increased technology. Because nothing was done, the population continued to decline, and eventually the catches did too. As of now, there's been a ban on fishing cod for over 20 years because the population has been so low. Increasing effort without increasing catches is a sign of an unhealthy population. Anyways, it may be clear that fishing needs to decrease on a particular stock, but to what degree? In this video, we're going to look at what we should be aiming for in a fishing quota. First, let's try to model how fish populations behave. Let's say this line represents fish population. This axis is population. And this axis is time or something. Let's say there's not a lot of fish in the beginning, so we're down here. They're going to reproduce, but at first, their population isn't going to rise that fast because there's not a lot of fish reproducing. As their population increases, more and more fish reach sexual maturity and the population rises faster, but then growth slows down as food and habitat space becomes scarce. And then eventually the death rate equals the birth rate. This is the highest population this particular environment can fit the carrying capacity. In reality, ecosystems are dynamic and this level is always, always changing. For example, if some food sources are depleted or the fish find other food sources or if they move around. And this is no small effect and when setting quotas, we can't ignore that. But for our model here, we're just gonna treat it as constant. So what this is showing is that down here when the population is low, the growth rate is low. And also when the population is high, the growth rate is low. Somewhere in the middle is where the fast growth is happening. Okay, let's take this same information, but model the population growth rate as it changes with the population. We're assuming the population is the only thing that affects the growth rate. So when the population is zero, the growth rate is zero because there's no fish to reproduce. At low populations, the growth rate is low. But as the population rises, then reproduction rises. At some point, food and habitat are starting to limit growth. Reproduction rates are still high, but they're starting to decline. The growth rate slows and slows until the carrying capacity is reached. Okay, so this is basically showing the same thing as this other graph. When the population is in the middle, the growth is fast. When the population is low or when it's high, the growth is slower. But what this graph can show us is what amounts of fish we can take and how it affects the population. If the fish population was here, then the fish is growing by this amount. So we know we can take that amount and by next time the population wouldn't have changed. If the population was still here but we took below that line, then next period the population would be greater. If we keep taking that amount, the population will grow and grow and grow until it reaches here. Now we're at the growth line for this fish. If we take this much again, the population isn't going to change. If the population were here but we took this much fish, then we're taking more than that period's amount of growth and next time the fish population will be lower. If we still take that much the next period, then it will be lower and lower and lower. What I'm calling the period will depend entirely on the ecology of the fish and requires a bit more insight. For simplicity, we're just sort of assuming that it's the growth in between fishing seasons and it only depends on the population of the fish. If you take a catch below the line, the population will rise by next period. If you take above the line, the population will fall by next period. Catches along the line won't change the population. So if you take an amount of fish in these areas here, the catch is sustainable. The population will change, but only until it reaches the line. In this way, the line is an equilibrium for the catches. But if the amount of fish is taken in this area, then the population will decline. Keep taking in those areas and the population might collapse. So it's always safer to be fishing when the population is high. If the population is low, we'll want to try to take an amount from below the line so the population is safely given room to grow. Okay, so based on this, how much should we be taking? Well, of the catches along the line, this point here allows us to take the maximum amount of fish each period. This is the maximum sustainable yield. Taking any higher will result in a declining population, so we could try to take a little bit less when the population is good, just for safety. I think this was 
was actually an old basis for setting fishing quotas, but it's pretty shallow. I mean, maybe it would be fine if our goal was to take as much fish out of the water as fast as we can. But that's not our goal. Our goal, or rather the fisherman's goal, and fisherwomen, who will hereby be referred to collectively as fishermen, fishermen will want to make as much money as they can for as long as they can. So our goal is to maximize the economic rent from fishing and to do it sustainably for as long as possible. If you're new to the term economic rent, don't worry about it. Just think of it as profit for now, the difference between the costs and the revenue. There are some important differences between rent and profit, which is why we're bringing it up. But for here, if you just think of it as profit, you'll do just fine. But I'm going to call it rent. Anyway, so let's change this graph to reflect that we're trying to maximize the amount of money made. Instead of looking at what amount of fish is taken from period to period sustainably, let's change this to what amount of money can be made sustainably from period to period. The line changes from what catches are sustainable to what earnings are sustainable. We're going to keep the line the same shape. You can look at it like it's just whatever fish was caught was then sold. And the price of fish isn't ever changing. Okay, now this is a revenue curve, the total revenue curve from the amount of fish caught. For the bottom axis, we have population, but we're assuming the population is only changing because of what we're doing, that is, how much effort we're putting into fishing. So let's track that instead and change this axis to fishing effort. This is how the population will be experienced by the fishing industry on a cost and revenue basis. If the population is low, then they have to put more effort into finding and catching fish because there's less fish to find. There's less fish in every net. Effort is a term that refers to a few things. It could refer to how long people are fishing, or how many people are fishing, or how advanced the fishing gear is. It's about how much equipment is on the fish stock. So more boats fishing, more time spent fishing, more advanced equipment, more efficient techniques are all increasing the amount of effort. While money and fish catch were directly related, effort and population are actually inversely related. As the population decreases, more fishing effort is required to find out where they are, and there's less fish in every net. Or we could look at it like, the more effort put into fishing, the lower the population will be. But we want low effort over here and have the effort increasing. So we're going to switch the axis. So that high fish population is here, and low population is over here as fishing effort increases. So look at it like this. We've come to a new stock, the population is high because we haven't touched it yet, and the more effort that's put into fishing, the lower the overall population gets. Okay, so now this graph is what are the sustainable earnings when certain amounts of fishing effort are put in. Let's say we come to a new stock at the beginning when the population is at carrying capacity, the equilibrium catch is zero. Right? The population is as high as it can be. There's no net growth. So there's no amount of fish that we can take without affecting the population. If we put in some effort, the equilibrium catch increases. We freed up some room for the fish to grow and the growth rate increases. So the equilibrium catch increases. But it's still low. The high population is limiting the growth rate of the fish. As we put in more effort, we keep freeing up room for the fish and the growth rate increases until it reaches this point the maximum sustainable yield. Coming up to this point, the population was still limiting growth a little bit. But after this point, it's the fact that the population is lower and there's less fish reproducing that's limiting growth. And this trend continues until there's no more fish reproducing. Keep in mind, we changed this axis from population to effort. With the old graph, when we caught a certain amount of fish, the population changed. And we could sort of track how the population changed when certain amounts of fish were taken season to season. But we can't do that with this graph. There's no population anymore. For example, let's say we come to a new stock and we put in a ton of effort. There's tons of boats fishing on it. Is the total revenue going to be this measly amount of money? Well, no, that first season they're going to catch a lot and the industry will have a high total revenue. The relationship between effort and revenue for one season would look more like this. The more effort you put in, the more fish you catch, until there's no more fish to catch. Here you can put in more effort, but you're not going to make any more money. But with this graph, when we refer to this amount of effort being put in, we mean after many seasons, and an equilibrium has been reached. Remember that previous chart, if we try to catch this amount, the population will change until the catch equals the growth rate along the line. This level showing the amount of fish that's taken is kind of like the effort, kind of. When we look at this graph, we're assuming an equilibrium like that has already been reached. This is after many seasons. Okay, okay. To determine the economic rent, we need to know what the costs are. Let's pretend there's only one person fishing on this stock, and fishing effort will measure just as the amount of time they're spending fishing. The first week of fishing costs 
this much. The second week costs this much. The third, well, each week costs the same. The total cost line is going to be a straight line. We're just assuming additional units of effort, extra weeks of fishing, always cost the same amount. Okay. To maximize economic rent, we want the spot where the difference between the revenue and the costs is greatest. There is an equation to derive it. Personally, I'm just going to eyeball it. It is here. We can fish more and make more total revenue, but the cost will increase by more from that point. So the total economic rent will actually go down. That's no good. Compare that to if we were back here and we wanted to put in more effort. The total revenue increases by more than the total cost, so we should be putting in more effort. We can be making additional rent. This spot is the maximum economic yield. It's the amount of effort where the rent is maximized. At the maximum economic yield, the catch will be sustainable. The rent is high as it can be. Everyone's happy. And note that the maximum economic yield is at a lower fish catch than the maximum sustainable yield. Even though we're catching less fish, more rent is being generated. And also the population is larger so it will be more resilient to other stresses. But the problem is fishermen don't study a graph, pick this point and say I'm going to fish with this amount of effort. They live day by day, year by year, trying to maximize their personal rent. So we need to look at this graph in a different way. Let's look at it in steps to see how the fishermen are thinking. We need to examine the marginal costs and marginal benefits. Let's say in between each of these lines is one week. Again we're still assuming this is one fisherman. If the fisher fishes for one week, they'll make this much revenue and pay this much costs. If the fisher fishes for two weeks, they're making this much revenue and paying this much in costs. But the extra revenue, the marginal revenue from an extra week's catch is this amount. The extra costs from an additional week is this amount. The third week of fishing will give them this much additional total revenue and they'll have to pay this much additional total costs. As I fill these in, note here, past the maximum sustainable yield, the total revenue is actually going down. They would be spending so many weeks on the stock that the population is getting to a point where additional effort is damaging the fish's productivity. Okay, how many weeks is the fisher going to fish? They'll fish until the marginal revenue is no longer greater than the marginal cost, when the extra week of fishing costs more than the money from the fish. Again, eyeballing it, it looks about here where the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. They could spend another week fishing, but they wouldn't catch enough fish to cover the cost of gas and labor and whatever. It's just not worth it, so they'll stop. Interesting, one person fishing alone will stop fishing at the maximum economic yield, which is great and all, but a stock of fish is almost never fished by one person. Okay, so what happens when the stock of fish is under an open access scenario fished by multiple people? They're going to be fishing with slightly different incentives. So let's change this up. We'll use the same chart, but this time let's measure fishing effort as the number of boats on the water. This will be just for simplicity. This will be the same effect whether we're talking about increasing technology or increasing amount of time they're each spending fishing, any other effort measure. The important thing is there are multiple people using the resource now. One fisherman will stop at the maximum economic yield. If he kept fishing, he could make more money, but not enough to cover those new costs. It's the same thing with multiple boats. And if the industry were acting as a single unit, they wouldn't add any additional boats. The additional catch doesn't cover the additional costs, but the new boat doesn't see it that way. They're not getting this amount of revenue, which wouldn't cover the costs. Right? They're there with everyone else. They share a total of the revenue of the industry. The total number of fish caught and the revenue only increased by a little bit, but they're not making decisions based on that. They only see their share. Okay, so an individual or a group acting as an individual will think, does this extra effort make the whole pie bigger? No? Then screw it. But working within a group that's not working together, people will think, does this extra effort make my slice bigger? The individual has the opportunity to gain more by, in essence, trying to get a bigger portion of the pie. So if we assume the fishermen always share an equal portion of the catch, then they're each coming away with just the total revenue divided by the total number of boats. Okay, so it's this line here. In between each of these lines is no longer one week, but the amount of effort that one boat puts in. Each boat makes this amount in revenue and spends this amount in costs. Okay, so this was where an individual would stop fishing. More effort means less rent. But here, the extra person coming in can earn some additional rent by basically taking a little bit of everyone else's. But remember, back there at the maximum economic yield was where rent was maximized. We're only going down in rent by going forwards. But people will keep entering the fishery because they don't see it that way. Even past this point, when the total revenue is actually decreasing, 
increasing. The new fishermen still see rent to earn. People will keep entering the fishery until that is no longer the case. That is here, when the total revenue equals the total costs. Now a new boat won't enter the fishery. They would buy a boat, hire a crew, and never find enough fish to cover those costs. This is the amount of effort that a group under open access will put in. At this point, the total revenue equals the total costs, and there's no rent being made. There's less rent being made, and in this case less fish being caught, and significantly more effort being put in than back at the maximum economic yield. Also, they could have caught the same amount over here for way less effort and way more rent. And now we're potentially in a danger zone for collapse. This is all less than ideal. We want to be fishing back here at the maximum economic yield. While one fisherman will stop there anyway, a group needs extra incentive to cooperate. And that's our next goal. In the rest of this series, we're going to look at a few more challenges facing fishing industries today, and then what are some things we can do to try to structure a fishery so that people fish at the maximum economic yield where population is relatively healthy and the rent is high.